Welcome to Forest Hills Church Online. My name is Pastor Andrew, and uh, we want you to know that we're a church who loves God with all of our heart. We seek to grow in our faith, and we hope to serve through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And uh, right now, in our grow groups, we are going through watching The Chosen, which is a a mini-series all about uh, Jesus as seen through the eyes of his disciples. And so as we go through those episodes, we've been talking about and kind of breaking down certain scenes and conversations that occur in those episodes on Sundays. So today, we are looking at episode two of season one, and it's all about the Sabbath, that ancient practice of the Jewish people um, that it's easy for us as modern Christians to sort of dismiss and say, well, that was Old Testament stuff. It doesn't apply to us anymore. But I think we have a lot to learn from this ancient practice. And uh, we will be talking about that as we go into our service. And to kind of set us up for talking about rest, which is what the Sabbath is all about, we turn to the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, excuse me, Matthew 11, verse 28, as our memory verse for this week. It's an invitation from Jesus. He says, Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. So we claim that rest, and we hope to live into that rest as we turn now to worshiping our Lord. I was a slave to 
Once freed from Egypt, God begins to form his people by presenting to them his law. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, for no form whatsoever of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals or the immigrants who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. We come now to our time of worship that we come to God in prayer. We pray over ourselves, our communities, our church, our finances. Lord, we ask that you will bless these things. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we know that we fall short. We fall short in trying to follow your laws. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of these transgressions against you. Lord, help us to become the Christians you want us to be. Holy Spirit, we ask that you pour down into us to give us the strength, the encouragement, and the wisdom to follow the way. Lord, in doing so, there's much you ask of us, but so much more that we receive. Help us to rest in you to not be caught up in the busyness of the world, the way that we make other things our idols, that we put you forth first and foremost in our lives, that we learn to just be in your presence. Lord, there's a lot going on, and in this busy time of fall, we have school stuff and church stuff and finance stuff that's all bubbling up to the surface. Give us the wisdom to know what to do in each situation. Show us the path you want us to take as a church and as a person. Let that your glory and your wisdom shines through. And it is not us and not our choices that come forth. Lord, we ask that you provide your guidance and your wisdom over the church leadership as they are in our normal time of church budgeting and church evaluations and getting ready for our church conference, Lord. We have our parsonage sale and our overall budget, and we just ask that you lay your hand across those that you give those who you have established as leaders within our church the wisdom to know what's best for your church, to know what's best for this community, for this world. Lord, in our daily lives, school has picked up, and we are busy. Lord, we ask that you give us the strength and the reminder to put you first. Help us to feel rested and renewed so that we come on our Wednesdays and our Sundays and get 
filled back up with your word and your, your wisdom, Lord. Help us to love you first. And we ask that you be with those who cannot be here in person on Sundays, but are here watching, that we feel connected as a church body. Lord, we ask these all in your name. Amen. Let me tell you a story. You think that impossible things can happen? Miracles. I can never forget what I saw. I'm so sorry, I, I, I don't actually know your name. I'm Jesus. Are you dangerous? Maybe to some. I saw him. It was incredible. I need to know if we have a problem. The man claimed to be God. False prophecy. Again, I ask you, is there a problem? The so-called miracle worker? Jesus of Nazareth. Apparently something good can come from Nazareth. <laughs> well, today we continue into episode two of the miniseries called The Chosen. Uh, and Last week we followed a storyline that that showed the desperation and fear of a woman who went by the name Lilith, right? Meaning of the night or demon. And we came to find uh, a certain stranger knew her real name, that her name was Mary of Magdala. And uh, it was by his hand that she was healed of this demon possession. We saw Nicodemus, a man of religious authority, and he stood before Lilith with the intent of helping her, of of exorcising the demons that troubled her, but he was unable to help her, claiming that she was beyond human aid. We also met Matthew, a young Jewish man who has betrayed his own people by working as a tax collector for the Romans. We're also given some context about the lives of Simon and Andrew, these poor Jewish fishermen just trying to keep their heads above water. So that's where we find ourselves. And today... Uh, the episode takes us back in time where we see Shabbat being celebrated by God's people in antiquity. And as modern Christians, uh, we need to be little historians. What we believe and, and the scriptures that we pro profess are all rooted in real history. And so we need to be aware of and look into the historical context of our beliefs and our practices. And so I, I appreciate what the filmmakers have done here, taking us back in time to the ancient practice of Shabbat, to the Hebrew people where, uh, where they practiced this day where there was to be no work done. No work done on the Sabbath day. It was a holy day. Simply meaning it was separated from all the other days. This command was literally set in stone way back on Mount Sinai. The, the people had been miraculously delivered from their lot as slaves to the Egyptians. They were brought safely through the Red Sea. And now God was revealing to them His law, His rules to live by, right? The ways in which they could honor Him. And the fourth commandment in the list of ten states, remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not work, or do not do any work on it. And that goes for servants. It goes for animals as well. They're beasts of burden. And so this is not a call to laziness or idleness. People are supposed to work. We were created to be productive. And so the other six days are filled with hard work, but not this day. The Sabbath is for rest. And then God includes the rationale. He says, The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in it, in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so this cycle of work and rest has been baked into the very creation. God rested not because he was so taxed and weary from creating all week, but because he wanted to establish rest 
as a blessing to His creation. And I think we all know that rest is best enjoyed when it comes as relief from hard work. Right? A lazy person does not actually rest. A lazy person cannot know how good it is. They've not, they haven't earned it. It's sort of a, a principle in life. right? The harder you work, the sweeter rest is. In the film, a, a mother states to her child that they practice Shabbat every week because it honors three things. She says it honors family, our people, and God. And so I think, I think the, the, you know, again, that's not necessarily a scriptural list, but I think the, the writers of the film have kind of nailed the purpose of Shabbat. It honors family because you rest together with the people that you live with, the people that you love. You take time to eat with one another and play games together and laugh and enjoy the time. There was no traveling allowed on the Sabbath, and so you would have been stuck at home with your family. Not, not to tolerate them, but to honor them. The second thing, Shabbat honors our people, they say. Because the Shabbat has been practiced by God's people since those days in the desert. Just as the day itself is set aside as holy, by living the practice of Sabbath, God's people are set aside as holy as well. God's people are set aside from all the other peoples of the earth. And so it has this effect of sanctifying God's people. The third thing, it honors God. Shabbat honors God who commanded it. So we should obey it for that reason alone, but also because Shabbat points us to the creation and thus the Creator. We rest because when God created, He rested too. It reminds us of who we are and where we've come from. Shabbat reminds us of our origin. And joining together in that holy rest with God is a blessing that cycles back each and every week. It becomes a normal rhythm of life. So throughout this episode, we see the Jewish people bustling around, getting everything prepared for Shabbat. Invites and food accommodations, they all have to be planned out because none of the work could be done on the Sabbath day itself. And sundown was the deadline. So Nicodemus hosts a fancy Shabbat with fine and expensive plates and cups, while Mary, formerly known as Lilith, Mary of Magdala, she hosts her first Sabbath by piecing together what little she has. But the hard work it takes to prep all of that is part of the beauty of rest. There's work involved with the rest. But taking a day, a, a mandatory day off, that can cut into profits, right? It decreases efficiency and productivity. Simon faces this challenge. He says in the, in the episode, he says, if I work on the Sabbath, I can catch more fish each week. I can bring in a great haul while everyone else is resting. It would be prime time to catch up on the bills. And mathematically speaking, Simon's not wrong here, right? How many of us think in terms of money and productivity? How many of us have picked up a, a shift on the weekend in order to boost the bottom line? And the film has inserted this subplot in which, which Simon is, is tempted to turn on his fellow merchant Jews who are fishing illegally. He's made a deal with the Romans that he will serve as their informant and they will uh, give him a pass on tax day. It's not a biblical account in any way, um, but it does illustrate the tension that the Sabbath brings to lives that are busy, lives that are overwrought. God gives us the Sabbath for the purpose of resting, and yet it stresses us out. We know it's not so easy to take a day off. We know it can be difficult when the pressure is on to pay down that loan or to, you know, to keep up uh, saving up for whatever project we might have in mind. But to rest in God is an act of faith. To rest in God is an act of faith. 
to not attend the crops for a day, or to decide not to go to market, to leave the, the sheep in the pen, to leave the emails in the inbox, or to keep the phone on silent, to leave work at the office, to trust that it will be all right until tomorrow. As an act of faith. God calls us to hard work, but at the same time, all we have belongs to Him. As James, uh, James who we meet in this episode, will eventually write in James 1.17, he says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Blessings come from God and we can rest trusting that He will continue to take care of us. Right? Resting in God is an act of faith. And one might think, as I did initially, you might think that this episode really makes a lot of this Shabbat thing. Right? I mean, as Christians, we understand the concept. Why does this whole episode need to focus on such an old practice? And then it just hit me that that's the whole point. Shabbat was and is an old practice. It, the, its age is the very thing that makes it so valuable. And we modern Christians, we enjoy new fruits from this old seed. We have a weekend cycle in which we take two days off. This, this leftover blessing, this is an after effect of the idea of Sabbath. But what do we usually do with those two days? Usually we pack them as full as we can. We travel, we make plans, we spend money, we attend to projects around the house, we clean the garage. Well, I don't, but some people do. <laughs> uh, you know, we may not be working at our jobs, but we stay busy. Our weekends are far from restful. In fact, we might even say the words, I have to take advantage of the weekend. I don't know if you've ever said that or heard that, but it's sort of the attitude we have. We have to take advantage of the weekend as though it's, it's something to be negotiated with. And God's invitation just stands there. It remains. Just rest. Just rest. Rest in creation. Rest is my long-standing offer to you. Honor me by resting. And this holy rest is exactly what Mary Magdalene was able to feel as she now lived out her days as a woman with hope, as, as a woman who had joy. Right? She goes out to smell the flowers. She no longer is plagued by the threat of demons. She was free. She was at rest. And she caught the attention of the Jewish leaders who, who noticed her marked improvement, right? Nicodemus, in last episode, he tried and failed to save Mary from the demons. And now, he approaches Mary to find out more information. Now again, this is not a story found in the Gospels. Okay? We, we do know from Luke chapter 8, verse 2, we know that Mary was delivered from seven demons. We know that she became a follower of Jesus. We do know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a great teacher of Israel. But we do not know if these two ever met. But that said, in this fictitious conversation, some important truths are told. When first he sees Mary restored and in her right mind, Nicodemus is, of course, impressed. He knew full well what she was like in the throes of her suffering. She, and he's holding out hope that his efforts to deliver her were actually successful. And so he implores her for more information. He says, I, I just want to understand how it happened. And Mary, for her part, she simply does not know. She can only claim one thing. She says, I was one way, and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Mary experienced a conversion, a transformation. She had a salvation experience, and now she was testifying. She was proclaiming that great change that had occurred. I was one way, and now I am completely different. That is testimony. 
Here we have a woman teaching a man who is a great teacher himself, and she's telling him about the things of God. She's proclaiming to him God's great power. And it's a fictitious conversation. But it mirrors the real conversations that were actually had when, if we fast forward a few years, we hear women rushing to proclaim to men what they had found, a certain tomb to be empty. Right? Testimony. Proclamation. It was simply reporting about the things that God has done in our lives. And in this episode, finally, the sun sets and Shabbat arrives. And Jewish people, rich and poor, they sit down to the same meal shared in the same way. Mary's house, a small hovel in a rough part of town. She has a few guests. Ill-mannered, blind, lame. They're outcasts, right? In fact, the one thing they all have in common is that none of them have ever been openly invited to a Shabbat meal before. And somehow Mary's house is the perfect venue for them. Mary's shy about her ability to host. And we find that she's made a small error by leaving an extra chair for Elijah. Right? This is only to be done once a year during the Passover, which, which celebrates how God saved His people from Egypt. But she's made a little mistake, and there the chair remains. Now, the tradition is to leave a chair for Elijah because Elijah was a powerful prophet of God in the Old Testament. You can read about him. I encourage that you do. He, uh, his story starts in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17. And he was a hero of the faith, for sure. The prophet of prophets. Uh, prophets spoke God's words. They declared God's plans. And so, leaving his spot for Elijah was a way for the Jewish people to remain open to hearing about God's plans. They hoped Elijah or, or someone who was a prophet like Elijah, would come and share the news that God has sent His long-expected Messiah. They were expecting that news. And so, the, the Messiah, of course, is the one who would come and save the Jews from the mess that they were in. The Messiah would come and defeat Rome in a glorious revolt and reestablish the temple as the dwelling place of God. And victory would come through the Messiah. And so they left a chair for Elijah to bring that news. And Mary left this chair for Elijah. But who should enter the room? Jesus of Nazareth. right? Not only an uninvited outcast, but the one who is ultimately rejected. Not only a prophet who spoke for God, but the prophet of prophets, God Himself. Not only the one who announced the coming of the Messiah, but none other than the Messiah Himself, Jesus of Nazareth. And we referenced this verse only a few weeks ago when we talked about conversion. But I would love for you to hear these words of Jesus again from the book of Revelation. He says, Look, I'm standing at the door knocking. If any hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to be with them and I will have dinner with them and they will have dinner with me. Church, Elijah is here. The Messiah has come. The wait is over. And today, we have, I want you to notice, we've covered the Bible from front to back. Right? God created the world in the beginning. He rested after six days so that we, in turn, could not take advantage of the weekends and take advantage of our time off, but to use that time to rest. To rest. To honor our families, our people, and God. And I hope that uh, as we enter into God's rest, the rest that He established in Genesis at the creation, that, that rest that is practiced by God's people in the form of a meal, and during that meal, God comes into our midst with a knock at the door as in Revelation. 
wanting to come in, wanting to dine with us. So if we are not too busy to hear His voice, if we're not too distracted to open the door, if we're not too ill-prepared to accommodate one more, He will come in and eat with us, and we with Him. The Messiah, the Savior, God made known to us, the one who heals us of our demons, the one who sets us free from slavery, the very Creator in whom we can find rest. He is standing at the door. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we going to let Him in? Will you let Him in? Will you enter into the long line of people of God and dine with the Messiah who saves? You come and find rest in Him today. Slow down long enough. I think we're all fairly slow at the moment, sitting and listening to a sermon. But can we slow down long enough to quiet our mind and to quell the the nagging demands that surround us? Slow down enough to hear the invitation of the Messiah. He speaks these words in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Amen. Well, as we close out our service today, uh, I just want to encourage you to continue to dig into the Gospels and uh, reading through the accounts of these men who followed Jesus. Uh, It's important for us to understand, you know, what is biblical and what's extra. So as you watch episode three, I encourage you to watch the episodes before we talk about them. Um, it's, it's, It's good to see what is in the Gospels versus what the writers are putting in. So episode three is kind of an aside. It doesn't really involve many other characters, but we're going to be looking at uh, Jesus relating to children. So it's kind of a fun episode we get to talk about next week. Um, also coming up, we have uh, keep your eyes open to volunteer opportunities at St. Andrew's Shelter, uh, a shelter that we as a church endorse and promote and help staff down in Hugo. So our week to volunteer is coming up, and we also have coming up an informational meeting. This would be September 24th, uh, the last Sunday in September. We're going to gather after church for an informational meeting talking about the possibility of selling our church parsonage. So if you want information about that, please come to the meeting, and we will have some info available. Um, So I want to close with our memory verse again. Jesus' invitation to us from Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. So just, I want to dismiss you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may you enter into the rest that He provides. Amen.